by SGR Knowledge Foundation. I am Samar Khurana, your anchor for the session. The session is 40 minutes long, and the topic for today's session is crime and sports. I'm very pleased to welcome Sir Suman Dube as the speaker, and Ma'am Pure Hart as the moderator for this session. An author and an entrepreneur, Sir Suman Dube studied at Cornell University and worked in the Silicon Valley. In his 20-year career, he has experimented with five different career paths across crime industries and in 12 global cities. Having developed unique exposure and perspectives from his wanderings, he has finally settled in Mumbai to pursue his two greatest passions, gourmet coffee making and fiction writing. Rupa Publications have recently published his book, The Fixer, a fiction thriller based on match fixing and cricket. Now, I shall also introduce Ma'am Pure Hart as the moderator for this session. Ma'am is the founder and director of the Finesse Academy and Trainings, an institution offering life transformative workshops, webinars and trainings, uh, training for students, professionals, organizations and institutions. Talking about her code interest, she is a surgeon by profession, a writer by heart and a seeker in spirit. She is forever in flight on the wings of imagination, soaring into the virtual realms of words and verses. She thrives on books, on chai, on fictionalizing philosophy and philosophizing fiction. She has been writing since she was eight, dabbling in various forms of the craft. Her poems and short stories have found their place in various magazines and anthologies. Her novels, where there's a will, Dialty for Terror, and a genre called Hope have been a great success with many rave reviews. We welcome you, ma'am, and handing this session over to you. Yes. Thank you, Samarth. And all I can say is um, I'm glad to be here for the second year in a row. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Dubey is an entrepreneur and writer who wears many hats and his first book is all about spins, boundaries and bats. I'm honored to be in conversation with him today uh, for what is a game after all if there is no fair play. So that's when a player shifts his focus from the field, the court and that's when he, all he can see is the currency note. So I welcome you all to this session on crime and sports. Uh, and um, Mr. Dubey, really nice that we can speak here. Thank you, Pierre Hart. Uh, actually, uh, I would like to start by welcoming everyone to this session. Thank you for joining in on a Saturday evening. I'm sure you have other things to do as well, but you gave us uh, your time and I'm immensely grateful for that. And I'm also grateful to the uh, Orange City Literature Festival for inviting me to this session and to Pure Heart, who is, uh, has been, uh, you know, grateful enough to, to agree to uh, host this session. And, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be a uh, very big honor for me to, to talk to her during this session. And I hope that you all enjoy this, this conversation about my book and about uh, generally about crime in sports. So your book, The Fixer, has an extremely engaging um, plot with a lot of twists. So how many googlies and spinners have you bowled at the unsuspecting readers? Uh, yes, uh, I, I mean, uh, you're right. It's googlies and spinners because it's a fiction thriller, which is meant to keep on surprising the uh, the reader at every uh, page. And, you know, unless uh, we are able to do that, we can't keep the readers engaged into the, into the story. And as an author, I uh, I recognize the fact that uh, every writer is competing with OTT platforms like Netflix for the time of, of the audience. And uh, one has to entertain and educate both at the same time for making it worthwhile for people to read. So this book, uh, this is uh, uh, the, the core story of this book. It came from a, a quote that I read many years ago. Uh, the quote goes like this, that when the gods wish to punish us, they answer our prayers. And it was a very, uh, it's a quote by the Irish novelist, uh, Oscar Wilde. Uh, and uh, it's the subject is 
aspirational regret that sometimes when we desperately want something, it might not be very good for us to get it. And uh, th this quote stayed with me, and I wanted to examine this from, a, from the perspective of a sports character who uh, has retired, and only sports people retire in midlife. So, and they can't go back to doing what they uh, have been doing. You know, you can't start playing again. So uh, that's why how it uh, it came to be a, a story of about sports because I wanted to understand or examine the unique desperations of a person who has finished his career in midlife and it's not a great career and now he's he's desperate for restarting something, redeeming himself, getting a second innings and those unique desperations which you know is connected to crime and uh, match fixing and things like that. Uh, that is what uh, this book is about and how he gets trapped into a, a bad situation and how he gets out of it in the end. Wow, that is some inspiration and um, that is how you started your writerly innings with a genre um, which is not so widely written about. So sports as a genre, uh, what do you, uh, how come you chose to write about sports in particular? Yes, uh, uh, actually, I, I have grown up in uh, this uh, Jamshedpur. It's a small city in East India, uh, home of Tata Steel. And uh, what's unique about Jamshedpur is that there is a playground behind every house. And uh, if you want to play, you can go uh, out and play. And when I was a kid, uh, most of my time uh, when I was not uh, studying was on the playground. And my parents used to have to struggle to bring me back into the house. Uh, and uh, uh, and thus I've played a lot of sports as a kid and even uh, in college and all the way to Cornell University as well, where uh, I played a little bit cricket because the American sport of baseball is pretty similar to cricket actually and you can actually uh, motivate some of the Americans to play cricket uh, as well. So uh, so sports played a very dominant role in my um, uh, formative years. And uh, there are some, uh, because I've played a lot of sports and I've observed a lot of sports, sports people, I have found some unique thing about sports which, uh, you know, make it so glorious in a sense that uh, the, great, the first great thing about sports is that it is, the results are, are instantaneous and un unambiguous. There's no other way of reading a result. You know, if you, uh, if someone has won, it is won, that's it. I mean, it's, if you have scored 100 runs, you have scored 100 runs. There's no other way of reading it. And the result is instantaneous as opposed to many other things in life, which you might keep on doing and you don't even know what has come from. So that's the number one thing. The second is that uh, sports gives us certain unique uh, qualities which are very vital for us going forward, even if we don't pursue career in sports. For every career, these qualities are important. Things like leadership skills, communication skills, when you're, especially in team sports, being able to communicate with people or being able to lead people on uh, who are not directly under you or who are your peers. It is a very difficult thing to do. Uh, teamwork. How do you get together and, uh, and and create magic out of it? And most importantly, which I have seen uh, the most is that it teaches you how to uh, deal with failure and accept failure as a big reality of life. And uh, the fact that failure can actually be the stepping stone for bigger things, that you come back again the next day and, and bowl again, even if the previous day you were hit for a lot of runs. This thing gives us certain qualities that when we go ahead in life, we are able to deal with the situations of life, uh, be it failure or success, and uh, we don't get bogged down or by, by bad situations. And these are vital skills to have, uh, which sports gives. And that's why sports is very, very close to my heart. And I chose to write my debut no novel based on sports. Wow, that's something. And uh, the way you spoke about resilience, because I too believe that every student or every child should be introduced to sports so as to get that kind of resilience and that uh, ability to manage failure, as you said. Yeah, so you have set your scoreboard rolling already with a book on match fixing. So any specific reason? Your, I think okay. I, uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I think yeah. We had yeah. An audio. So right. Can so you... I yeah. I I I said that um, yeah. So resilience is one of the very strong uh, points uh, that you brought out uh, in sports. Uh, any specific uh, reason you chose um, cricket because you set your scoreboard rolling uh, uh, with match uh, fixing. You know. So 
that uh, right so yes uh, uh, as i said before that uh, um, although i have uh, played uh, various kind of sports soccer and badminton and tennis and squash as well uh, in university uh, cricket is the one that i played the most uh, and i think that's uh, that's an indian thing as well that we love simply love the sports and i remember that uh, when india won the 83 world cup uh, uh, in jamshedpur there used to be no tv station at that time so there was no television in my house and my father in the night was listening to the commentary on the final and when kapil dev took richard's catch uh, that very difficult catch we ran backwards and took it the whole neighborhood erupted in in celebration and the next day there was a huge procession of people who had come out to to celebrate the win and that 90 uh, that 83 win apart from a major sports victory was something that made us believe as a nation that we can you know occupy the center stage we can you know take on the world and we can become world beaters it gave us gave us a lot of self belief and confidence so cricket is exceptionally close to my heart and uh, regarding the connection between cricket and match fixing see there is uh, and the subject of the story where i was as i was saying i wanted to examine the situation of a person who is uh, become uh, you know who has uh, finished his career in midlife and he's got a less than successful career and he is desperate now we have got very good examples of cricketers who uh, are in this situation for example uh, i don't know how many of you know about this cricketer called unmuk chan who uh, just like virat kohli our current indian captain he uh, was also the under 19 uh, world cup winner ca- winning captain of india and uh, he was also supposed to like seamlessly going and join the nation, uh, the senior team and uh, you know following the footsteps of virat kohli but if you see unmuk chan just did not work out well in the in the national level and to the extent that today unmuk chan does not even have a ipl contract similarly with irfan pathan for example in 2004 irfan pathan won the icc emerging cricketer of the year award he was 20 at that time by 27 he had played his already played his last game for india and he just recently retired like a couple of years ago uh, and uh, then there are some cricketers who have actually had very successful post cricket careers for example sanjay manjrekar or sunil gavaskar or ravi shastri who have had successful uh, careers in uh, cricket commentary and then uh, ravi shastri is now the national coach as well and there are some cricketers who have not handled post retirement well at all players like maninder singh uh, the spin bowler who had even uh, alleged, allegedly uh, attempted suicide because uh, of depression after game and chetan sharma who also was in, was in trouble and so the, the point i'm making here is that cricket apart from being close to my heart also has got some these glorious examples of people who are inspirational in uh, you know uh, shaping the character that i wrote in the, about in the story so although this character my character in the book is not based on any particular cricketer but all of these stories have come together combined to to give me good ideas of how to create the situation for this guy wow so um, i'll go on to the uh, more serious part of the topic and um, uh, so who gets to finally decide uh, the fate of a match uh, as to whether the last ball will be a sixer or a fixer yeah uh, yes uh, so you know uh, when we think of match fixing we always think that the that you know the players are compromised to an extent that they have just lost all their sense of right or wrong and they are so down in that hole of corruption that they really have lost all their bearings about things but in in reality actually that that doesn't happen uh, all the time it happens sometimes but doesn't happen all the time because there is something glorious about the sporting arena the field you know when you are in the thick of that moment when you are competing and you have got fans around you and you realize the 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 very big position that you have where you are managing the expectations yeah. of so many people and representing who you are representing um, and, and and you might not follow a cricketer who is who might have agreed to do a match fixing and uh, might not actually do it in the end so uh, so uh, i will say that apart from anomalies like you know, some people under performing uh, in, in 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 matches i think more of, often than not it's the sixer who, who wins that is the sport who wins the sport is much more glorious or much bigger or more powerful than any match fixer and uh, what do you feel is it only the players who are involved in all this or uh, there are 
there are many more people in the whole uh, hierarchy of things very very good question actually actually uh, what the common mistake we make uh, make and i am also guilty of the same before i wrote the book was to think of corruption uh, in sports as only match fixing and uh, that's the most more uh, uh, prominent thing because we hear so many, uh, we have heard so many stories about uh, match fixing but match fixing isn't the only uh, crime in sports in fact match fixing traditionally happens to underperform uh, there is a role of uh, you know using performance enhancing drugs to overperform uh, perform beyond what you can not normally do or uh, and there are various other people involved players involved in the in, in sports it's a very complex ecosystem it's not just the players there are coaches there are administrators there are uh, people who run the sports bodies there are uh, privately owned uh, sports teams now uh, they have been uh, yeah, you know, more popular outside india but now with ipl and the other other mm-hmm. leagues that have come up there are privately owned leagues so there are lot of uh, Uh, people involved on like in my book the uh, the character we are talking about who actually does corruption or the crime is a coach and he and he is is uh, not a player he was a player and when he was a player he no one could move him i mean uh, uh, and make him do uh, something wrong but one now when he is in this stage of his life where he is mm-hmm. uh, uh, where he is trying for a second innings where he wants to leave a legacy on the game which he couldn't when as a player that that desperation just just makes him lose reason you know uh, lose the sight of what is right and wrong and uh, and then from there on he he, he starts getting compromised but towards the end he redeems him but even in this story it's not just this coach who is who, who is the villain here in terms of compromising the owner of the team and the overall ecosystem the the contracted players etc the uh, uh, i mean uh, in, you know uh, one great example that i can uh, talk of uh, here is uh, also the, uh, the 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 strange case of greg chapel you know greg chapel was a was a was a coach of india uh, during sarab ganguly's time and uh, in fact you know it was sarab ganguly who got him uh, into, uh, into into indian cricket and it was a disaster of two years for for indian cricket and uh, uh, greg chapel brought his own brand of Uh, politics into the team and uh, he created this uh, divisions and groups inside the team and it, it is supposed that he you know he single handedly responsible for irfan patan's uh, you know uh, poor career because he just you know just played with his mind and uh, irfan patan or if you look at even mohammad kaif who was also a very uh, talented cricketer of that time and uh, so uh, it is very uh, juvenile or it's, it's naive to think of uh, match fixing as the only uh, crime in sports uh, there are many other things and generally the match fixing is a result of the other problems that are there in sports right but uh, the final common pathway or the final pawn is actually the player and yet uh, people idolize them cheer them celebrate them so what is it about the sports person that is so magical yes actually uh, uh, sports people uh, you know uh, they embody embody certain qualities that we all aspire for yeah. uh, and that's the general uh, uh, thing in life that you know we we admire people who do things or have things that we can't do or have and uh, like for example for sports sports people the discipline the dedication or the talent and uh, the personality which naturally comes with 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 playing sports and the fact that they have the conviction and the courage to pursue a, a risky career path a sports is very very cruel uh, profession and it can bring the best among us down to our knees uh, as much as we see the great successes of of sports and and the uh, world famous sports people there are more number of people who were talented and who who, who got knocked down by sports poor bad injury bad luck uh, that difficult catch which no one can normally take and that somehow stuck to somebody's hand and then you never got a chance to play again so the fact that they can uh, risk their careers with something as you know uh, dangerous as sports in in a way that that uh, no one knows what the outcome of that will be uh, is so much safer to follow conventional paths uh uh you know uh, and so that's that's the reason and the fact that they naturally have leadership skills 
they they can lead people uh, when they when they stand somewhere and say things people listen and uh, and i think they all deserve the the aura that is around them and the high respect that we give them uh, because they really are doing something which we can't do and we are still to do maybe but uh, Uh, it, we can all learn from what these uh, these people uh, embody generally in life. Yeah, the, I, I too appreciate a lot of qualities in sportsmen, especially when it comes to patriotism and integrity. I mean, uh, I'm sure you'll have a lot of examples of those as well. Uh, yes, uh, actually, like for for example, uh, if you see what happened after the. uh in the the 2000 match fixing scandal which was the the black day of international cricket if i may say uh you know when hansi kronier uh, was trapped uh, or was recorded by the delhi police to uh well uh, fixing matches uh with indian bookies and then some indian players were involved as well and later on initially he denied and then later on he uh admitted it on in in uh, on camera that uh, he had uh, he had actually fixed match it broke people's heart because hansi kronier with his personality the person who had led south african cricket to such glory after they came out of the apartheid in uh, imposed ban and revamped uh, south african cricket and the great indian players who were who were involved uh, as well uh, it just broke the trust of the uh, uh, the, uh, the the people who watched the game who loved the game uh, they did not know what they were watching on tv is it real or is it a made up thing but then what happened from there was the, was actually the bigger story from then the with the leadership of saurav ganguly and the great gentlemen of indian cricket uh, anil kumble sachin tendulkar vvs lakshman uh, rahul dravid uh, the the integrity the passion the commitment the patriotism that they brought to the game and they restored the game to its to its glory and what they through their personal conduct uh, and through the lives they have led and their their lives outside cricket uh, what what they what they uh, have lived uh, you know they, they brought the sanctity back to the game restored its former glory and personally however much i admire their on field exploits i really regard their off field exploits to be more consequential into that dark era that that was there and and thus you know uh, uh, we are blessed uh, as a nation to have these players at that bad time to to bring the game back to where uh, it deserved to be yeah so at on the one hand we talk about integrity and on the other hand we talk of corruption so where is the line and when do uh, players actually cross that boundary yes uh, see uh, uh, as i said before that uh there's a large ecosystem sports is a large ecosystem and uh, just blaming the sports people alone for the corruption is is a, is a mistake even the match fixing that they, uh, a particular sportsman might be doing is a culmination of many things that that might have happened and uh, as i said I also said that sports is very cruel and then you know uh, uh, people people who are some many sports people who are very talented they are not able to make it and they in mid career they might have lost form bad injury but let's start from the beginning if you look at the journey of a sports person i mean in a country like india uh, 20 years ago at least indian cricket used to be dominated mostly by players who came from uh, the metros uh, especially delhi and bombay uh, and um, bangalore to some extent and then from there it spread out uh, obviously you know uh, uh, players from uh, from smaller cities ms dhoni good example from rachi came up now this did a good a lot of good from from the perspective of you know giving players more opportunity but when it was not there when these opportunities did not exist it was an amazing uphill task for players to to make it to anywhere in the in the in the national team the sports training is exceptionally uh, expensive it requires uh, equipment it requires expert coaches it requires academies Uh, it requires mentorship, and you need more than a fair amount of luck, as compared to other professions, to get noticed somewhere. So all these make sports people exceptionally vulnerable. Uh, they realize they have a lot to lose. They realize they have got a very short window in which their careers will operate, and if they can't, uh, you know, make it in that window, and then they'll retire uh, because it's a very, it's a age-dependent thing. And then apart from that, the 
the things that make sports glorious also work against it in a sense that the fact that we look at sports people as heroes and we idolize them and uh, you know we run up to them and take autographs when we meet them in uh, airports and uh, you know uh, outside anywhere in the field you know uh, uh, it, it might get to their head uh, there's a lot of blood a lot of there's a lot of uh, uh, you know uh, uh, prominence that comes with this uh, uh, with the game and sometimes it can get to head so so it's a culmination com combination of various things that leads to corruption I i'm talking only of sports people now uh, uh, it can be poor poor uh, education about the, the about the perils of this kind of compromise uh, one good example is that uh, this pakistani bowler mohammad asif who was just 20 when he was trapped uh, into match fixing he was bowling no balls every odd over and he, he received a ban of five years at the peak of his career and uh, the poor kid did not even know that this this can be this bad so someone fooled him into thinking that yeah you know uh, this, uh, this is no problem at all no one can catch you so poor education vulnerability lot of investment into going into becoming a sports person uh, a short window glamour and money which can go to your head for sportsmen and for the other people who are corrupt in terms of the administrative etc you know it's a multi billion dollar global industry there's a lot of states involved and uh, you know the control of sports bodies the control of uh, privately owned teams uh, coaches uh, getting co coaching assignments all of them are ripe for uh, making compromises because the stakes are very high uh, and uh, and thus you know the less uh, solid among us might succumb to these kind of pressures. Yeah, so that really makes them much more vulnerable and that's why uh, they can show their strength by not giving in to those. But there are conditions where they lose that strength or they just give in. And um, where does their weakness lie? Is it just money? I don't think so. So what do you feel? Why do they do, yeah, do I, this if they, if they have to? Yeah, I think uh, as I said, you know, I mean, if if it generally in life, if if it gets to our head that uh, that you know uh, that we have got a lot to lose by not doing something, that's a time when we become vulnerable. And I'll take you back to uh, this character in my book uh, because he is he has retired now and he can't go back and play, and his family buys a cricket team, and uh, a privately league cricket team, and. He is looking at this team as his, his great opportunity of redemption, where he can actually uh, flourish as a coach, take the team to victory, and leave a legacy on the game, which is the most important thing for him. He wants to leave a legacy on the game, which he has not been able to leave as a player. Now, what is playing in his head is the fact that there is a lot to lose if he doesn't get this coach. And the moment you get that, and I'll take you back to the Oscar Wilde quote, which I said a little while ago, that moment it comes to your head, that this is something that is a do or die for me. This is a once in, in a lifetime opportunity. If I let it go, I'll never have it again. That's the beginning of, of, the, of the time when you can somehow start conditioning your mind that, hey, it, it is fine to do this. And that's from where, it, where you get a slippery, go to into a slippery slope from which you might not never recover. And when you are less secure than you, what you should be, or when you have poor ed education about the process, about the perils, uh, when you do not know how easily you can be caught, or where you do not understand the level of tracking that happens. Uh, you know, Ben Johnson, for example, uh, Ben Johnson, uh, uh, I don't remember the year now, but in, in one of the Olympics, uh, maybe 20 years ago, he beat the 100 meter uh, record by which is which is two, it was out around eight odd seconds or something like that by two or three seconds imagine the imagine the impossibility of of that and he had obviously taken performance enhancing drugs and he uh, did not realize that he will get caught uh, in the after the post uh, after the race when he is going to be tested he's going to get caught now this this is baffling because he's, this is not the first race that he has ever ran in he knows that drug testing happens but if the desire to beat Carl Lewis, who was the the, uh, the dominant other dominant racer at that time, the, the need to beat him was so strong in his head. Like, if I can't do it normally, I'll do something. Uh, you know, coming second is not an option. I'd rather get caught. 
so when you get into that mode that i'll rather get caught than you know be uh, be somebody ordinary or uh, you know not be able to excel in the way i want i want to excel that's the point that is the point where you develop that critical weakness from you you can be exploited so uh, do you mean that it's not just uh, money but also ego and also uh, not wanting to let the fans down right so this is what actually drives them into something as drastic as this right exactly uh, 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 and uh, a great example of this is the american cyclist lance armstrong uh, lance armstrong won the tour de france which is the uh, one of the toughest sporting event anywhere in the world seven times in a row and this uh, uh, this race it circles uh, the country of france 2300 miles uh, through the city and also through the alps so it's mountain region and plains it's horribly grueling he won it seven times in a row after surviving cancer after he had undergone all the treatment that required for cancer chemotherapy radiation etc which really destroyed somebody's body the to your point pure that he was so eager to prove maybe first to himself and then to 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 to, to people around him that cancer is nothing you know i will i will i can beat cancer and still win this kind of a, a, a race this is not a ordinary badminton match all right this is a 2300 mile race across from much of it is mountain region uh, that that desire was so strong in his head I mean, of course, if you read his books, uh, the one one good book that he had written was um, "It's Not About the Bike, My Journey Back to Life," where he talks about this post-cancer uh, training and how he used to uh, train during the uh, during the winter months, off peak time in the Alps. He was a very very dedicated cyclist, more dedicated than anybody else. But even he knew that it's not going to be enough to win this kind of race. So he won seven. Years in a row, everyone suspected during that time. Not his fans, but the administrators suspected during that time that uh, there was something wrong. And Lance Armstrong was very smart. He did not take any performance enhancing drugs. He took performance enhancing blood, oxygenated blood. Oh, yeah. And which he was was taking uh, from uh, as intravenous, and uh, he used to cover up those uh, little marks using makeup, so that people can't see uh, see those those little marks and. eventually he got caught and he came on oprah's show and admitted uh, this thing and uh, there are millions of people all over the world who had been motivated by him inspired by him that he, they can they also can overcome their personal situations uh, however bad they might be uh, and lance just broke the hearts of so many people uh, that's true so that, yeah yeah so actually uh, i guess they are under a lot of pressure uh, due to the expectations also and uh, this makes them do so many different things and so i think we've covered a huge spectrum of the types of corruption in sports right from match fixing to taking drugs stimulants even uh, uh, this kind of new uh, techniques that people devise uh, various type of oxygenated blood and these are all the types i think we've covered a great deal plus we've seen w- what their final um, uh, you know if they actually are banned from the game they uh, they are nowhere to be um, found later on or their lives are actually ruined so um, maybe we can just um, what do you feel sometimes people uh, resort to corruption to overperform so as to not let down the fans and at other times to underperform just to get money or something like that they'll bowl a no ball or they'll not hit a six or they'll get out so there is the overperformance and there's the underperformance if you were the fan which one would you forgive more easily or which one would you never forgive yeah this is a this is a very uh, tricky question because i think uh, fans by nature Uh, especially sports fans are exceptionally emotional uh, emotion is a very key aspect of uh, of of sports of following sports or playing sports uh, and a good example uh, again of this is that you know recently uh, diego maradona died uh, rest in peace uh, he uh, was a hero for for uh, millions of people around the world and he is probably the greatest footballer ever now there is a uh, in in 19, 1986 uh, he played in a charity match 
and the opposing captain was uh, Michel Platini. And Diogo Maradona was wearing a shirt which I didn't say no to grab. And Michel Platini was wearing a shirt which is which I didn't say no to corruption. And the referee was Pele. As luck would have it, Diogo Maradona got banned because of using drugs, and <laughs> Platini got banned because for life in, uh, for 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 corruption in sports. Point I'm making is that. Even after these transgressions, even after these, uh, you know, uh, compromises they have made, they still ride high on uh, in the hearts of people. But for that, there has to be something that makes them emotional, makes the fans emotional. If you look at Diogo Maradona's case, for example, very interesting case because because he had done this hand of God, uh, handball, uh, an unfair play in the '86 final against England, and. Uh, then he got caught for using drugs, but even then he so idolized. The reason is because of this underdog story, the the fact that he had come from Argentina, the fact that he was this diminutive person, the fact that he used to be always attacked on the football field by everyone. They would bring him down. Down. They wouldn't allow him to run at all. Mr. Dubey, I'm sorry I'm going to interrupt you, but we have to answer two quick questions. One from uh, the first one from the audience is. Um, and they say that, they, what are your views on fantasy cricket games emerging online? And are they promoting crime in sports and celebrating it virtually? Uh, actually, I disagree. A quick, I don't... quick answer for that because we have yeah. uh, two more minutes and one more question to go. Yes, yeah, I disagree. I don't play fantasy sports at all. So I don't know the mechanics of it, but I know what they're about. They are legalized betting. And legalized betting is very important because illegal betting is one of the main reasons for match fixing because it, it is controlled by the mafia. So anything which leads to legalized betting is good and to that extent, fantasy sports is good. Okay, that was an interesting take. Um, and uh, what about, what do you feel? How does corruption in sports, uh, is it any similar or any different from corruption elsewhere? And I think uh, that will be our last or second last question for the day. Let's see. No, I think corruption is corruption. I think it's universal. Uh, the fact that it's done by sports people just makes it more prominent. And, as a, as, and two minutes ago, I was talking about the emotional part of it. Because we are so yeah, emotionally attached to, attached to sports, we think they are bigger crimes. Uh, but the, the underlying mechanics that goes on in a person's head which leads to that corruption is the same whether you are a sports person or a normal person working in any other profession. It is about the fact that you you, you want to win something unfairly and you do not believe that you can get it in the right way. And you do not mind doing that small amount of compromise that, that, that needs to get there. The mechanics in the head is the same, I think. It's just sports is more emotional, so we think it is bigger. So I think we should uh, uh, end on a uh, positive note. If you can just tell us, are there any ways or techniques or uh, methods that administrators can um, uh, adopt to stop or curb crime in sports? I think the main thing is counseling. You have to tell people that you how easily they can get caught and how how big the tracking is. That's one. Second is you have to subsidize sports. Uh, if sports continue to be so so expensive in terms of training and equipment, the more investment people will make, uh, the more vulnerable they will be. Third, you have to promote all sports, not just cricket. Because I might be very skilled in football, but I've gone into cricket because it's more uh, liquidity and I'm not able to make it there. I can become corrupt. Great. So I think uh, we have to wrap up the session now. And all I can say is that I really enjoyed it. And thank you so much Same here. for uh, enlightening yeah. us. And maybe I'll just end with uh, a little um, a couplet. And that is like, um, when matters go to the court of law from the court of grass, that is when sports lose their magic and become a farce. So I think we should wrap up awesome. there and thank you so much. Thank you. Awesome. So much. Congratulations. Thank you very much you. For, your, for, for hosting this. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you so much, sir, Amam, Amam, for this amazing talk. I'm sure the audience was delighted to witness all of this. I also thank the publisher Rupa Publications for all the help. 
on behalf of Orange City Literature Festival, we sincerely express our gratitude towards your acceptance for the session and knowledge shared with us. Thank you, ma'am and sir. 20 years of existence. Two universities. 23 educational institutes. Offering 137 courses. Rai Sony Group of Institutions. A vision beyond.